In spring 2008, as newspaper headlines around the world warned of enormous changes taking place on the Arctic ice shelf, a combined military scientific expedition set out from Fort Eureka on Canada's Ellesmere Island in support of International Polar Year. The goal of the mission was to transport scientists and equipment under near impossible conditions to the edge of the continent in order to make scientific observations. The distance is so vast and the climate so severe that few humans have ever set foot there. Our small film crew traveled with the Canadian Rangers to document the changes taking place at the top of the globe. The amazing discoveries made on that expedition stunned the world. Our journey began in Yellowknife on the shores of Canada's Great Slave Lake. Satellite photos had shown large changes in the Arctic ice shells, and we were on our way to the top of the world to document the effects of climate change firsthand. As a filmmaker specializing in environmental issues, I have a special interest in this mission. As we flew north over the endless miles of Arctic wilderness, the stark beauty of the place and the incredible distances were almost overwhelming. Welcome to Eureka Nunavut. At long last I was here, it had taken over 10 months. The giant Hercules had landed and offloaded all the prefabrication equipment that would be necessary. I'd recruited a top-rated documentary crew and was hoping to learn more about the correlations between global warming and the Arctic melt. You're about to be totally immersed with the Canadian Rangers on Ellesmere Island to patrol the coast of the high Arctic. Rangers were hard at work constructing the Kamatex, the ancient sleds we would use to transport everything we would need for our 12-day trek for 36 people all in turn supporting a group of scientists investigating climate change. The Rangers are a diverse group comprised mostly of Inuit, but also First Nations and Canadians from below the tree line. This is seven hours north of Yellowknife by turboprop on Ellesmere Island. It's right here on the map. You can see that the uh, magnetic north pole is even south of us, so it's uh, pretty far. And it's a balmy minus 25 right now. Just ask these earlobes, they'll tell you.
We would need a lot of fuel and provisions. For two days we packed, and after a quick prayer, we were off. My name is Whitney Lockenbauer. I am Assistant Professor of History and Chair of History at St. Jerome's University and a Canadian International Council Fellow this year looking at Arctic sovereignty and security issues. I've actually undertaken a lot of research looking at the relationships between native peoples and the military. So I was drawn to the rangers as this incredible success story. We might think of the Inuit and other northern peoples as the sort of new do line at this point in time. They're actually on the front lines of climate change. They're observing firsthand the dramatic changes going on. Operation Nunavut 2008 is an example of an enhanced sovereignty patrol. So whereas traditionally the expectation of the rangers was that they'd be able to operate around their home community, now these are opportunities for the rangers to operate outside of their area of comfort. In the southern imagination, when we hear Canadian Arctic, we immediately think of snow. But it's not the weather that's the defining feature of the north from a military standpoint, it's the vastness and it's the isolation. Seldom do we think about the fact that you can fit all of the landmass of continental Europe into the Canadian territorial north. We're talking a geographic area that represents 60% of the landmass of Canada, truly beyond the realm of most of our imaginations. Nothing describes the scale of this place. The tranquility, the silence. The direct predecessors of the Canadian Rangers are actually the Pacific Coast Militia Rangers. This was a group that was established in 1942, soon after the attack on Pearl Harbor and British possessions in the Pacific. British Columbians were terrified. All of a sudden, this coast distance isolation, which had allowed them to feel a sense of security, now all of a sudden suggested vulnerability. There wasn't a Canadian military presence of sufficient size along the coast, so people in communities decided to get together and request that they be able to take some sort of local action. Hence, this group, the Rangers, was created to act as potential guerrillas if needed. If somebody came and invaded, they'd be able to repel an invasion just long enough for other forces to come on side. When members of Southern Canadian Forces units go up to the north, and even foreign militaries are training in places like Goose Bay, they rely on the Rangers to teach them how to survive in what for them is a very foreign, foreign environment. So the Rangers will teach them things that are very natural to them. Hunting and fishing techniques, how to survive on the land, whether it's building a snow house, whether it's building a lean-to until somebody can come and help them. Some things really do stand the test of time. Another example would be the Canadian Rangers rifle. The Lee Enfield Mark IV is a bolt action rifle. Most of them were actually smelted during the Second World War, but it's proven to be a very hardy rifle, very reliable, withstanding the rigors of the Arctic environment for decades. And certainly the Rangers have taken countless seals, sea mammals with that rifle over the years. It's seen a lot of action, but some things do stand the test of time. In the 1920s, explorer Wilhelm Stephenson would talk about the friendly Arctic, that the Arctic wasn't the scary place it had been portrayed by some people, that if one learned to adapt and behave like the people who lived in the region, particularly the Inuit, one could get along quite fine. Now predecessors, like Sir John Franklin, who didn't follow this sort of advice, paid for their folly. They paid with their lives. Oh, 
Holy smokes, that was great. So you were going to tell me a little bit about how scouting was part of your family's generation. Well, ever since I was a little boy, my father started teaching me all the traditional skills like how to be a hunter, look for dangerous spots, stay nice, all that stuff. So I was mostly using my my eyes where to go. Like I, I, I just try and take a good route so nobody will get hurt. My name's Doug Stern. I'm a long-term resident of the Arctic. I've been up there over 25 years. I've been a ranger for uh, 20 years, and I've uh, been working up in northern Ellesmere Island at Kootenuk Park National Park for the last eight summers as well. When I first saw the ice shelf up at uh, the north coast of Ellesmere, I was just staggered by the immensity of it all. I mean, I'd never seen anything on that scale. Uh, you know, 20 miles long, when you think that it's 40 meters thick and floating on the Arctic Ocean, you're just thinking, my goodness, what an amazing ice feature this is, and what a stable one it is. And then, of course, I have a lot of historical books, and when I read Perry's uh, travels on it in 1906, when uh, he traveled on the same uh, coastline by dog team, he's traveling on a solid ice shelf right from the east side of Ellesmere Island right to the west side, right over the top of the the uh, island and it's a solid ice shelf and uh, it looks like it'll be there for eternity. I remember that one day it was like April 1st or 2nd and uh, Adam Ukuktunuak, a, a fellow ranger from Joe Haven and myself went out to uh, a snowmobile to one of these research sites on the ice shelf and we come across this huge, huge crack and it's uh, incredibly big. We stop, of course, get the cameras out, take pictures, and when you see Adam standing on the edge of the crack, he looks like a tiny little stick. I mean, these cracks are just massive in size. And the most interesting thing was to go back in August, and uh, I, was, I work for Parks Canada, so we were up there doing a survey, flying in helicopter, and we're flying over the ice shelf, and what Adam and I had skidooed on, it's no longer there. It's, it's broken off, floated into the Arctic Ocean. And here we were, where the Inuit had been for thousands of years. Only now change had come to the land. I've noticed from uh, listening to elders in my community and other communities in the Arctic that uh, I, they seem to be quite uh, worried about what's going to happen in the near future because they, listening to them, their stories of uh, the, the amount of uh, storms in the past, the sea ice conditions are really different than when they were kids. It's not, it wasn't always easy, but we got around. Always have to look out for smooth part, smooth areas on the ice, and it was harder for me to find. So after getting on the high point of the ice, we would try to hit that smooth area. It was a great experience for me to have to lead a good bunch of guys up here. New land for me, first time to see, and it was challenging and yet fun. It's a vast, incredibly humbling part of the world. These guys 
go to the land to be in. There's another day here, possibly. So we'll see what comes of it. I hope that film can do justice to the people, the people of the land that we'll be getting much more intimate with as the days come and the way they relate to the land and what they think of as far as changes on the land due to various things. Took a long time to get here and I hope you like what you see. Meet new people. You'll never know what you're going to see the next day. Never. Or the weather. might see something else. Even in the same place, day to day was different. Hey, we went out on that Neil Glacier one day and it was good going, and then we saw a haze in the sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just and I thought, you know, that my, where I'm from, that means there's water there and causing yeah. steam. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think anything of it until Richard and uh, Johnny came back. They went down there to check it out. Yeah, there was water. Oh, yes, as I yeah. And it opened up. No, that was yesterday. 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 Yes, yesterday. What? what was that? The yeah, last point? The Me first one okay. from here? Oh. So that, kind of on the edge of the ice shelf? Yeah, on the, on the left. On the side. left. Yeah. South side. Yeah, we were oh. trying to find a way to get to there. Oh, okay. Next thing, it's nice to see you. So that's actually part of the ice shelf. Must have just cracked, I guess. Hmm. In the last few years, there's been uh, some pretty big indications that there's big changes going on. And uh, in preparation for our snowmobile exercise from Alert to Eureka across the top of Ellesmere, we did an air uh, recce by Twin Otter in uh, March. and. Uh, Scientist Derek Mueller from Trent University had noticed on RadarSat 1 a new crack that was very distinctive on the on satellite imagery. So we thought we'd see one crack. Well, we fly over and we see, well, there's a crack, there's a crack, there's a crack. There's cracks all over. And they weren't just little cracks a few meters wide. These things are up to like 30, 40 meters wide and they look like canals. Yeah, well, I had the opportunity to fly over the cracks during our, uh, our recce uh, in, in a plane, and these cracks stretch off into the distance. They are really long, uh, kilometers long, and up to like, 40 meters wide, so that's substantial width. Some of them, um, you know, if you fell in, you would, uh, you would fall for quite a long time. You'd get hurt, actually. Uh, so the rangers had to be careful when they were driving around on their snowmobiles. We found that clusters of poles that were put in there to measure the ablation or how much the ice shelves melt every year are actually have moved 73 meters to the north in one case, 53 in another, and 34 in a different direction. So it really shows that the ice shelf is totally unstable, it's broken up, and it's probably gonna be history in, in uh, the, the near future. So when we look at these ice shelves, it's clear that we're seeing big new changes. On Operation Nunalavut in 2008, we saw big new cracks across the water and ice shelf. Well, if you look at ice shelves in other places, in Antarctica, for example, it's not that unusual to see cracks along ice shelves and to see icebergs breaking off the front, that's what we would normally expect. The big difference to these events is that they're really one-way processes. We see ice falling off the front, new ice islands being produced. But in the Arctic, we're not seeing new ice that's being, that's replacing the ice that's falling off. In a system that's balanced, you'd expect new ice coming from behind to balance that ice that's breaking off the front. But we're not seeing that. It's really a one-way process. The ice breaks away, and once it's gone, it's really gone forever. Hey, Jim, how are you doing? Beautiful day. That's why I'm here, thanks. 
Hey, I got a story for you, Jim. It's a story about a, a scientist and a ranger and a filmmaker. So they set out to do the research and uh, they get way out on some ice shelf and as they're working away, taking samples, they hear this thunderous crack. And uh, they thought that was kind of strange, but they go about their work. But by the end of the day, they come back and find they can't reach their camp because a, a great big wide crack is split through the ice shelf. And then uh, after a while, they, they, they noticed in the distance there's a, a bottle or something shiny in the water. Between the three of them, they're able to, to fetch it out of the water. Well, the, what, what it is is a Coleman lantern. That's a magic lantern. He lights the lantern, and then what should appear in the glowing mantle but a genie. And sure enough, he grants each of them one wish. As tough as these guys were and as cold as it was, there was still room for creativity. It's music to a Canadian ranger's ears, the sound of the de Havilland Twin Otter resupplying a ranger patrol in the high Arctic. My name's Joe Spears, I'm a maritime lawyer and I'm also the principal of the Horseshoe Bay Marine Group. The Twin Otters operated by 440 Squadron of the Canadian Air Force come from a long line of aircraft that have been used in over 80 countries and they're the workhorses of the North. One of the great things about the Twin Otter is you can actually land it on a southern runway on the end of the numbers, which you don't normally see when you're flying in a commercial jet. These aircraft have been in operation since the early 1960s and you can put them on skis, tundra tires or floats. In addition, these can fly nice and low and slow and it helps the rangers if they need to recce a patrol, like the last one on Ellesmere Island, which led to this scientific research. The patrol or the recce flight found all the cracks in the ice that led to this research. When you combine the pilots that are highly trained, you can use the Twin Otter for a variety of purposes as we've seen. You can load skidoos, people, fuel, cameras, scientific equipment, medical supplies, you name it. If it can fit through the doors of a Twin Otter, it's likely been carried, and I'm sure there's been a few kitchen sinks, amongst other things, that have been carried by the Otter. The Hercules, as Canada calls the C-130, is a very dependable, solid airframe, and when it comes to operating in the Arctic, these aircraft are critical to the success of any activity, whether it's climate change research, pollution response, law enforcement or medical evacuation or search and rescue. The Hercules has been operated since the 1950s, and these aircraft are dependable, solid airframes that can move men and equipment into short fields. Traditional Inuit didn't venture that far from their communities, but as we get into new areas and new activities and scientific research, they're venturing further and further afield. And they need this air support to make these operations a success.
My name is Ian Townsend Gold. I'm a law professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, and I've been working on ocean issues, law of the sea, since I was an undergraduate student back in the 1970s. My arrival in Canada in 1980 coincided with yet another big push in the search for oil and gas in Canada's offshore, and the, that affected the Arctic as much as anywhere else. I also have done quite a lot of work off the East Coast, um, but now, of course, the Arctic is back with us, uh, thanks to the revival of claims to extended jurisdiction for oil and gas purposes uh, in the wake of the environmental problems which are now obvious to us all, leading to a, a melting of the polar ice cap. Coastal states have been making claims to offshore jurisdiction uh, for the purposes of oil and gas activities since 1945, with exploration has, has have cut fines, in, not in the Beaufort Sea but elsewhere, and of course the oil industry loves this. Success breeds success. But there was always the problem of the ice cap, the fact that these is a frozen area um, and very inhospitable and therefore very ex expensive. Um, but with the melting of the ice cap, the, what appears to be the situation is that areas hitherto inaccessible or very expensive to work are now within technological and economic reach. And so countries are dusting off ideas to, as regards who can claim what um, in the Arctic. Right now, Russia, Canada, the United States and Denmark are all busy mapping out their uh, continental shelf because they have to get the claim into the United Nations and set the rules for who owns what up there because they're already busy uh, uh, planning uh, future uh, exploitation of the area. So the, the, those who say, let's divide the cake between the five lucky countries, are going in the face of the accepted rules of international law and are basically proposing to take from the international community as a whole. But international law does not allow this. International law rules on jurisdiction are very clear. States have a territorial sea of 12 nautical miles and then they go beyond for a further 188. This is the famous 200 nautical mile limit. Um, inside that they have exclusive rights for the exploration of and exploitation of living and non-living resources of the sea, the seabed and the subsoil. They don't claim sovereignty outside the territorial sea. They have only exclusive rights to explore and exploit. The other thing is, uh, with no ice cover in the Arctic Ocean, that opens it all up to commercial fishing. There'll be tremendous pressure by fishing nations to get up there in the Arctic Ocean and start fishing it. It's the last ocean in the world that's never been fished. I mean, the shortest route from Japan or in Asia to Europe is...